As we pick up in 1 Timothy 4, Paul is advising Timothy about folks who are making mountains out of molehills, who are taking a few things about marriage, and they're making it a really big deal, saying you should never ever be married, and taking food, what you eat, and saying, you know, this is, this is something we need to get really uptight about. We should only eat these foods, not those foods. And Paul is having to respond, no, you can get married. Eat whatever you eat. Give thanks for it, and it's fine. Don't worry about it. And, and so the challenge that they're facing right then is that, uh, that Ephesus is facing is leaders who are taking something reasonable. Maybe some people shouldn't get married. Maybe don't eat everything. And they're, they're pushing it to an extreme. And, and so Paul is telling them to, to relax. Whatever you do, do in the name of Jesus, and it's going to be fine. And then he points out that your family and as family you need to point out to each other when you do go astray like this timothy you don't get to ignore this problem you don't get to pretend it's not happening you have to tell them the rest of this uh, book, which uh, is using the language of family, that the church is family, uh, it, the p way Paul points out how family works is to say to love each other as family is never to just condone what another person asks, uh, wants to do because they're family, and it, it doesn't work like that. If someone we love is doing something they should not, we, we have to point it out. And Paul points this out in the context of, uh, he uses the, the language as language like working out. You can work out the bodily disciplines. He uses, it's the term, it's the term where we get the word uh, like gym or gymnastics. Like you can work out like that and you could, but that won't, it's not, it's only good for this world. The working out that matters, the working out that makes a difference in this life and in the life to come is the disciplines and the working out and following Jesus. The, the, so be, being careful to pay attention to one's speech and conduct Conduct, one's love, faith, and purity, giving attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting and teaching. We have gone 12 verses, and we've already gone from uh, people making mountains out of molehills to you got to tell people when they're wrong, to uh, that, that we're going to do this how we're with family. And, and if it feels like Paul's like jumping all over the place, he is. Like, Paul is just bouncing all around. It feels like when you're leaving for a trip and, and someone who cares for you and worries maybe a little bit too much is telling you all the things all at once. Now do this and this and this and don't forget about this. It feels like that's what Paul is doing here. And, and so that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to follow Paul through. And if it feels like Paul is jumping, well, blame Paul. That, that's the best I can do for you on this, is that we're going we're gonna to follow what Paul has to say with Timothy from this last chunk of, of this, this letter. So Paul is talking about how leaders, you have to be able to point out when people do what is wrong. And then he uses a phrase that becomes the favorite of all youth pastors or all pastors serving first-time churches. He says, let no one look down on your youthfulness. You ever heard the sermon on that? I might be 20, but you can't dismiss me. Look right here. Paul says it. And let no one look down on your youthfulness. For the young can be wise, and sometimes the old aren't. It depends on whether people have learned from their experience. And what matters more is whether we have each sought the godly disciplines. What the godly disciplines where we, we take the, what God has given us. And we do something with them. Paul continues to say, uh, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the elders. Put these things into practice and devote yourself to them so that all might see your progress. All right, so Timothy, you're going to be a leader. You can't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But you got to do something with the gifts you have. So to have a gift is an invitation to do something with it, to practice it, to use it as a, as a discipline so that, as Paul puts it, all might see your progress. Every person here has been given gifts by God, and then the question is, what do we do with them? A friend of mine is a pastor down in Springfield, and the way he thinks about, one way he thinks about how people are, have different gifts is he thinks of how some people in the church are like rabbits. They run out, and they grab people, and they bring them back, and they're excited. Here, we got something going on at church. Come here, 
come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. And they go and they grab people and they bring them back and they're like rabbits. And they're really good at it. But that's not the person who then takes them when someone comes into church. Then there are people in the church who are like shepherds. And they're the ones who want to sit down and drink some coffee and listen. Right? And just listen. Huh, that, that, that's pay attention. And then there are the people my friend calls the horses. The ones who are just going to show up and they're going to work. Is there something to do at the church? I'm going to show up. I'm going to work. Don't want to talk. Don't want to do anything. Give me a job. I will take care of it. Right? And you can think of the various gifts we have in various ways. That's how my friend puts it. But to have that gift, to, to we all know sort of our own leanings. Right? To, to know that we have a gift of a certain clinician, yes, that's good. Have we worked with it and developed it so that, as Paul puts it, all might see our progress? Everyone sees what we're doing with the gifts that we, we have been given. And so Paul then moves on to, to point out, like, Timothy, uh, no one can look down upon you because, let no one look down upon you because of your youthfulness. Use the gifts you've been given so that all might see the progress that you are making. And, and in the middle of this family in which sometimes you have to tell people when they're wrong, you need to look at everyone as, as exactly that, as family. Older men, you got to treat them like your dad. Older women, treat them like your mom. Younger women, treat them like your sister. Younger men, treat them like your brother. Right? This family is a family that is built on respect. And that's what leadership ha has to hold on to. And um, it is interesting to me that uh, to say you have to be able to tell people when they're wrong, and you got to treat them like family in the midst of it. How do you disagree with your dad? How do you tell your dad he's wrong? Think about that. How, what, what does it take? I, I've done it, right? When you disagree with your dad, you do it respectfully and humbly and patiently, right? Or, or how do you tell your mom that she's wrong? In the same dynamics, like how do, you, how do you tell your brother that you think he's wrong? Because you know what happens if you, t you tell your brother he's wrong too often, is he just gives you, and he walks away, right? Or a younger sister, right? So, the, for Paul to tell Timothy when someone runs astray, you have to be the one to tell them. But never forget that you are treating them like family means that we have to treat them, that's a, a certain way of talking to each other. And I think that's important to hear in a day and age when leaders can be viewed as acting very differently than that. So the per one of the most people I heard most about as an amazing leader growing up in sort of the, the, the world, I heard a lot about business leaders. And, and one of the most important business leaders of the last generation is this dude you might have heard of, Steve Jobs, who here has an iPhone, who here had an iPod, who here, who here has little thin uh, laptops that aren't those big old blocky Windows machines from a decade ago, but who, who has those little thin itty bitty things you just slide into your back backpack, right? Steve Jobs led Apple to invent all of these amazing objects and, and, and a, an amazing leader. But you know what he was? A jerk. If you look up Steve Jobs' jerk in Google, you will find how he ran interviews and how he treated people. And I could tell you the stories, but frankly, I don't feel comfortable telling those stories from the pulpit. They're really crass and rude, right? And so, in a culture that tells us leadership, you can do whatever you want as long as you're right, no. We, we read this, and we read the way that Paul tells Timothy, you can tell anyone what they need to hear as long as you love them like your own family. Love them like your dad, or your mom, or your children, or your brother, or your sister. Tell them. Actually, it's interesting. He never, that's the one thing he didn't say. He didn't say, treat younger uh, men like they're your children. He does, that's the one thing he didn't say. Because what's the thing you assume you can tell your kids? What to do. Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, treat them like they're your kids. He says, treat them like either your parents, or they're your siblings. I just realized that right now in the pulpit. Sometimes sermons change on the fly. So, treat everyone like family. They're not your kids, even if you want them to be at times.
And, for, and, and it's interesting also, for, church becomes the place for those for whom family has not always been good. Church becomes the place they can experience what family should look like and feel like as they gather here. So then Paul goes on to address one particularly challenging aspect of family, something that uh, we have still grapple with today. What do you do with grandma? What do you do with grandma? After grandpa is gone, who takes care of grandma? If you go to a nursing home today, who, what is most of the nursing home full of? Little old ladies whose husbands are gone. It's true today. It was even more true back then. What is the first thing the church had to figure out in Jerusalem? In Acts, right? What do we do with all of the widows? We have all of the widows, and we need to make sure to take care of them all. So the first job in the church, the deacon, was created to make sure we knew what we had to do with grandma. So what are we going to do with grandma? Women tend to live longer, more violent culture, men die quicker. And so Paul doesn't just say, well, take care of all the Christian little old ladies. That's it. Take care of them. He starts asking questions. How are we going to handle this? How old is she? If, if, she's old, if she's young enough to remarry, she should get remarried, right? If she's old enough that she can't get remarried, has she taken care of the saints? Has she welcomed people into her church? Does she have other family to take care of her? Paul says, if you have a, a widow in your family and you don't take care of her, even though you're a Christian, you have made yourself worse than an unbeliever. Right? To not take care of grandma when you could is like to damn yourself. I fully expect my mom to take this chunk of sermon and to play it back for me in about 10 years. Um, it, she's going to love it, right? But uh, this is the place where, like, we could, I don't think it's worth getting into the, the details of exactly how, how Paul spin this, spins this out. Like, what age at which, if, if what Paul says, if you're older than 60, we'll take care of you, but if you're younger than 60, uh, you need to get remarried. And, and, like, he goes through all the nuances. I don't think we need to hash the nuances because those are entirely conditioned by an economy and a culture that we don't have anymore. Uh, we have things like social security. Security. Social Security was not even a thought for another, what, 1900 years. It's, it's, it's going to be a while. But I do, and especially because Paul gives different advice for the church at Corinth. It's, it's not like we can say, this is what Paul thinks about how we take care of the elderly. Like this exact approach. But what we can say is that Paul pays attention to the nuances and the details. So make sure grandma's taken care of, and that's going to be a complicated thing. And here, Timothy, here are some details to look into for how this church does it at this place. And at the end of the day, you just got to make sure that grandma's taken care of while not blowing up the church budget. Because as Paul points out, there's a lot of widows. And here it is, the year 60. The church has only existed for 30 years, and they're already talking about the church budget. Isn't that somehow... I don't know what that is, but it is, yeah. I mean, you can just see Timothy and Paul saying, like, we can't feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. We're going to have to figure out something. Well, let's, let's work out how we're going to do that. It's still a challenge today. How do we make sure that the elderly are taken care of? What do we do with grandma? Paul pivots and talks about the other folks in the church who are older. He talks about the elders who lead the church. He says, make sure that they're taken care of. You shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. So, the way that you separated grain in the first century was you dug a pit. You took all of your grain that you cut down, you tossed it in the pit, and then you put an ox in there. I don't know how you get the ox in the pit. Sorry, I'll have to go look that up. But you put an ox in there to walk in a circle on top of the grain and crush all the grain. And then you take the ox out, and then you take the grain and you throw it up in the air, and the wind blows away all the chaff, all the light stuff, and all the wheat, the kernels that are heavy, fall back down into the pit. And there you have, that's all your grain. I would not want to eat that bread without looking at it really closely. It doesn't sound like a completely sanitary approach, but it's what they did. 
They lived. We're here, right? And so you don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Because what does the ox do while going in a circle? He reaches down and grabs a bite whenever the ox is hungry. I'm not sure I would want to compare the leaders of the, the board, like the board of the church. Y'all are oxes. Congratulations. But uh, I do think it's interesting, again, 30 years into the existence of church, it's the year 60 when he writes this, and they're having to figure out how to deal with staff and how to take care of staff and saying, if you're working for the church, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. The laborer deserves to be paid. And they're dealing with the same thing. Like, these are PPR problems they're dealing with. Paul says to Timothy, and if someone has a problem with an elder, you got to have at least two or three. If there's only one person who's complaining about it, about the, the leader in the church, the one person's not enough because there's always going to be one person who's not happy with Andy. I mean, the pastor or the elder. Andy, right? You got to have two or three before we really need to chew on it because to, be, to lead is someone's never, so, someone's always going, always going to be annoyed. And you, Timothy, you better make really certain that when you uh, ordain someone, when you lay hands on someone for them to be a leader, you better make certain that they're the right person to choose because if they're not, you're going to have to deal with it publicly. You're going to have to bring them up front and you're going to have to deal with it and say to everyone gathered, this is who it is, this is the problem that happened and you don't want to do that so be very careful about who is a leader in the church especially if they are going to be people who stir the pot who have a morbid craving for controversy for disputes about words for those who come for from these come envy and dissension and slander and suspicions and wrangling among those who are depraved of mind and bereft of the truth who imagine that godliness is a means of gain don't put anyone in a position of authority who want to do it so that they can get ahead. It's not going to work. Right? Paul continues to say there's a great gain in godliness combined with contentment. We brought nothing into the world. We don't take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we can be content with those. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation or are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the path, from the faith, and pierced themselves with many pains. You ever seen the t-shirt that says, he who dies with the most toys, that line? This is kind of in that vein. Whoever dies with the most toys spent their life trying to get toys. And isn't that a shame to spend your life focused on toys? There is contentment in following and leading, being part of the church, but it's not going to be because you're going to get a lot more stuff. So Paul does seemingly bounce all over the place. That, that's it. We have now covered all of 1 Timothy. These last, these last couple of minutes, we covered the last chunk of 1 Timothy. And while he does bounce all over the place in these last paragraphs, he is weaving together a coherent picture of what the church looks like when it is running in a healthy fashion. Not that this church is perfect, because there is no such thing as a perfect church. There really isn't. I would know. No one's ever found, no one's ever told me about one. Every pastor I ever talk to, if I ask them how it's going, they'll tell me, I got some good things, and then, man, I got this. There's no such thing as a perfect church. But what there are are healthy churches, where as Paul describes, there is respect for wisdom in the leaders of whatever age there are, a church that tells the truth when people go astray and does so in a way that treats people like family, a church that cultivates and hones the gifts that each person has, a church that takes care of the people who are in need and all of the complexity of, challenge, of figuring out who, who does what to take care of grandma. And then Paul just wraps it up with this commission, and I want us to end with this. This is how Paul says it, and I don't think I can improve on it. He says, You, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all that is evil, and instead pursue a righteous life, a life of wonder, of faith, of love, steadiness, and courtesy. Run hard and fast in the faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ, who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and do not slack off. Our master, Jesus Christ, is on his way. He'll show up right on time. 
His arrival guaranteed by the blessed and undisputed ruler, high king and high God. He's the only one death can't touch, his light so bright no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes, human eyes can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule. Amen.